I'm Renee Barger, Associate Vice Chancellor for the Health Sciences Library System, better known as HSLS. Our library offers support and collaboration for the university's six schools of the health sciences. In this inclusive environment, we offer a wide array of information services, educational opportunities, and resources in print and electronic format. Our virtual and online services are featured on the HSLS website, and our physical home of Falk Library provides spaces to study, collections and exhibits to engage our visitors, and day-to-day -day support for questions and assistance within the health sciences community. It is my privilege to introduce you to our featured historical collections from our rare books room. The rare books and special collections at HSLS consist of more than 10,000 medical texts and artifacts published as early as 1496, as well as print and audiovisual materials of local interest, which span more recent decades. Founded in 1883 in conjunction with the Chartering of Pitt School of Medicine, the library's collection began with contributions from the first faculty members of the school and has grown to feature an international array of sought source materials. Today's historical collection, housed in Falk Library at Scaife Hall on Pitt's Oakland campus, brings together rare books from the former libraries of Pitt's schools of medicine, dental medicine, graduate school of public health, nursing, pharmacy, and the UPMC Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic. The collection does not normally purchase new artifacts, but donations of private collections have contributed to the continued growth of this unique collection. The collection is available to students and faculty, as well as the public by appointment. In 2019, a new space was created in Falk Library to house the collection and ensure the preservation and longevity of the materials it contains. Dr. Gosha Fort, Head of Digital Resource Development, manages the organization, access, and preservation for rare book and special collections. In her role, she also oversees web-based and digital projects, which increase the visibility of library historical collections. Gosha has been a part of HSLS for over 20 years and frequently shares collection highlights with the Pitt community through the HSLS Update newsletter. Today she will be featuring select items from the collection rarely seen by the public. We hope you enjoy this episode of Medical Treasures of the Health Sciences Library System. Episode 4, Anatomy with Italian Twist. Today's episode is mostly about atlases. It is much more exciting to show books with illustrations, and anatomical atlases have plenty of them. Atlas is a book of illustrations on a specific subject. Images may be accompanied by explanatory text or not, but I would not call an anatomy book an atlas if it did not have any illustrations. It is their essential part. Also, the text, if present, is subservient to illustration and explains only what the image shows. HSLS has a large collection of anatomical atlases some of which I had already presented in the first episode, but there are many others to choose from. Therefore, today we will limit ourselves to looking only at Italian atlases. Atlases which were created by Italian anatomists or published in Italy in the 16th through 19th century. Each century will be illustrated with the examples from our collection. The earliest Italian atlas we have is by Juan Valverde da Musco, Anatomia del Corpo Humano, published in Rome in 1560. And since it's not possible to talk about 16th century anatomy and not to mention Andreas Vesalius, we will also look at the Italian edition of the Humanico Polis Fabrica Libri Septem, 
published in Venice in 1568. These two atlases come from the School of Dentistry Library. Juan Valverde de Musco, a Spanish anatomist educated in Padua, is known as a plagiarizer of Vesalius. He has more in common with the famous anatomists than the illustrations used in his atlas. They were both graduates of the University of Padua. In addition, his teacher, Raldo Colombo, professor of anatomy in Padua, was Andreas Vesalius's friend. Valverde da Mosca published his works in Italy. Even the earlier Spanish version of his work, like the Italian translation we are looking at, was printed in Rome. He did that because he wanted to achieve a better quality of illustrations than Spanish publishers could offer. He worked with an engraver from France, Nicolas Beatrice, and an artist from Spain, Gaspar Becerra, both influenced by Michelangelo. Was he a plagiarizer? He borrowed most of his illustrations from Vesalius. I added to the comparison of Italian editions also the plates from the earlier 1555 edition of Vesalius, because the earlier editions would be the ones Valverde da Musco knew and imitated. When we look at the side-by-side -side comparison of plates, the similarities are striking. Looking at the same illustration also allow us to see what is different. The elaborate backgrounds in original illustration were slightly simplified in the plates created for Valverde da Musco work and almost forgone in the later Italian edition of Vesalius. I will come back to the changing styles of anatomical illustrations in a moment. The orientation of figures is also different, and the printing technique too. Plates in early Vesalius are woodcuts while Valverde da Musco used engraved copper plates to print the illustrations. In the process, he received a reversed image of the original illustration. Some researchers object to calling him a plagiarizer because he acknowledged he copied from Vesalius. In addition, Valverde da Musco took Vesalius' work and checked all the findings described in the Fabrica by performing the dissections himself and subjecting thus the studies to intel intelligent reworking. In this process, he corrected the studies in his drawings of muscles of the eye, nose, and larynx. He provided only four original illustrations out of which the most spectacular is the muscle man holding his own skin in one hand and a knife in the other. He also tried to change the style of presentation and he wrote his own descriptions. The clarity of his description is one of the reasons why it was Valverde da Musco's anatomical work which achieved a greater dissemination throughout Europe than the Eclime Vesalius. The Human Corporis Fabrica changed how anatomy was studied and taught, and it influenced next generations of anatomists. Referring to Vesalius and borrowing from him was not that rare. We will see this also in later examples. 
So while the size remains the most important anatomical atlas, the anatomy of Valverde da Musco was the most popular. It was published 16 times in four languages in a span of one century. The next century will be represented by two atlases. Tabula Anatomica by Pietro da Cortona, published in Rome in 1741, and Tractatus Quatuor by Hieronymus Fabricius, published in Frankfurt in 1624. The first of these was purchased by our library in 1941. The second one was acquired by Dr. James Hurd in 1933 and later donated to Falk Library. It is also my only example which is not an atlas. Pietro da Cortona, born Pietro Berettini, was the most influential painter and architect of the Italian Baroque. He is also the author of anatomical plates something he worked on in 1618, before he had become well known. The plates were probably engraved by Luca Ciambellano, but they remained unpublished until 1741, when the work finally appeared in print thanks to a surgeon and publisher Gaetano Petrioli. Therefore, this atlas belongs to the previous 17th century. The plates depict muscles, viscera, and nerves. Judging by the emphasis the nervous system receives in these illustrations, it is possible that the drawings were originally meant for an anatomical text dealing largely with neurology. The figures are in highly dramatic and studied poses, keeping in style with other Renaissance and Baroque atlases. The human body, even dissected, makes one think of a nobleman in various moments of his daily life, always located in a landscape. For a better viewing of specific parts of the body, the author uses a mirror as a kind of magnifying glass in which the relative anatomical areas are explored in greater detail and the hidden parts are exposed to a viewer by partially separated and folded down muscles. Petrioli added to the plates his annotations, which today are regarded to be of little value, and smaller anatomical drawings taken mostly from Vesalius, but also from other anatomists. These editions were removed in later publications. The presence of landscapes in the background and dramatic poses used by Pietro da Cortona in his illustrations align with 16th and 17th century styles. But my next example is the harbinger of change. Girolamo Fabrici da Quapendente, better known under his Latin name, Hieronymus Fabricius, was an Italian surgeon an anatomist and one of the founders of modern embryology. He spent most of his life in Padua, eventually becoming chair of surgery and anatomy. During his long career, he attracted students from all over Europe. Fabricius changed the teaching of anatomy by designing and using the first theater for public anatomical dissections. He also contributed to the development of comparative anatomy and surgery. Since his work on surgery in our collection, 
does not have any illustrations. Therefore, I chose to show his Tractatus Quatuor. Like Pietro da Cortona's work, it was also published posthumously, though with much shorter delay. It includes four treaties. His advanced embryology work on the forming of the fetus, two texts on speech, and the treatise on Venus valves. The book is bound in fine old leather with a ripped spine, gold lettering, and decorative stamps. It has 41 copper plates including a spectacular engraved title page with a dissection scene and images illustrating the organs of speech inside of the diaphragm and an umbilical cord wrapped around the neck of a fetus. This work illustrates not only his interest in comparative anatomy and embryology, but it is also a great example of the new style in anatomical illustration. Fabricius focuses strictly on technical issues, and he abandons the backgrounds and artistic poses present in his predecessor's works. We will look at two works from 18th century. Anatomici Summi Septem Decim Tabula by Giovanni Domenico Santorini, published in Parma in 1775, and Vasorum Lymphaticorum Corporis Humani Historia et Ignographia by Paolo Mascani, published in Siena in 1787. Santorini's book comes also from the old school of dentistry library, like the first two examples I showed. And I find it really interesting that I chose three atlases for this episode, which were purchased in 1949 on the same day. Giovanni Domenico Santorini was an Italian anatomist. He studied in Bologna and Padua and he received his doctoral degree at Pisa. As a meticulous dissector and contributor to the knowledge of anatomy, he is credited with discoveries of many structures, such as facial muscles involved in emotional expression, accessory pancreatic ducts, and duodenal papilla. This outstanding anatomist of his time is honored with 12 anatomical eponyms bearing his name. The most known is Santorini's plexus, identified and described in 1724, and still relevant to contemporary urologists seeking to minimize bleeding during urological procedures. He is not credited with the discovery of accessory pancreatic duct because technically Friedrich Rausch wrote about secondary duct earlier, but Santorini's dissections prove that it was not an anomaly but a normal structure. Anatomici summi septem decim tabule is another example of a posthumous edition. It was his student, Michael Girardi, who compiled and issued Santorini's unpublished drawings and observations 37 years after the author's death. It contains illustrations of many parts of the human body, including the organs of smell and hearing, the pharynx, breasts, heart, stomach, liver, intestines, pancreas, and bladder. Out of the 21 plates in the book, the 17 mentioned in the title were by Santorini. This is one 
of the best 18th century atlases due to the high quality of images and descriptions. The next work by Paolo Mascagni is an example of how anatomy bridges art and science. Paolo Mascagni, an Italian physician from Pisa, did not practice medicine, but he devoted himself to teaching and research instead. He worked as professor of anatomy at many universities in Pisa, Florence and Siena. He was the teacher for both physicians and artists. His Atlas of the Lymphatic System is the greatest medical achievement. He perfected a technique of injecting mercury and following its flow, enabled Mascani to create a detailed map of the system. He discovered 50% of all the lymphatic vessels. His was the first systematic description of the lymphatic system with masterful illustrations realized by engraver Chirasanti from Bologna. The man in Mascani's work is the living mechanism, the device to be explored when on dissecting table. To him, bodies are biological organisms to be studied in their constituent parts. Apart from the fabulous illustrations, there are two other facts I like about the author and his work. First, Paul Mascani was not only a committed researcher, but also a book collector. His private library consisted of 200 volumes on anatomy alone. As a bi bibliophile myself, I cannot leave this fact out of my presentation. Second, a recent discovery disproved the old belief that brain and meninges are devoid of lymphatic vessels. The presence of the meningeal and lymphatic system was accepted in 2015, and in the follow-up review of historical descriptions of lymphatic vessels in the central nervous system, five earlier ones were found. Thus, in 2018, Mascani has been posthumously credited with the first discovery of meningeal lymphatic vessels. Uncovering facts like this one is rewarding because it proves that the dusty old volumes in our care are still relevant to modern science. This book, as well as my next example, both come from the Mark Ravitch collection. Dr. Ravitch's family donated his private collection of surgery books to the library in 1992. I will close the perusal of Italian anatomical atlases from our collection with Antonio Scarpa's Atlante delle Opera Complete, published in Florence in 1839. Antonio Scarpa was an Italian anatomist, excellent surgeon, polished writer, and medical illustrator. During his tenure at the University of Pavia, it became the leading educational institution in Europe for the study of anatomy. Scarpa pioneered a program of anatomical demonstrations and required students learn by practicing the section on their own. As rector, he was more the dictator of the university than its leader. His ruthless demeanor earned him no friends. He was feared by students and colleagues alike. Although he was not a lovable person, his innovative teaching methods and the excellent books he authored earned him the respect of the medical profession. 
He is remembered as a great surgeon, anatomist, and discoverer of the nasopalatine nerve. His study of the hearing and olfactory organs is considered classic. He was the first to correctly delineate the nerves of the heart. In his authoritative work on hernia, he described perennial hernia from direct observations, thus settling any earlier controversy of its existence. His work, Practical Observations on the Principal Diseases of the Eyes, raised ophthalmology to the level of an autonomous science. His illustrations, in which science and art become one, are spectacular. The artist's focus is on the anatomical details, but even dissected parts of the body are artistically draped in cloth to draw viewer to look at the anatomy and not the act of human dissection. You are invited to join us for the next and final episode of the series Medical Classics, during which we will look at some milestone works from antiquity to 1800s. If you have questions about any of the items presented today, please feel free to contact me by email at gosia, G-O-S-I-A, at P-I-T-T dot E-D-U.